heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Disney's fight against activist Nelson Peltz. Well, it steps up as it has a win of support of Value Act Capital for its board nominees. We'll break down the latest. Plus, Bitcoin reverses course and wipes out gains from this year as uncertainty lingers around the SEC's ETF decision. More details ahead. And is 2024 the year US-China tensions finally hit Apple? Yeah, we're going to dig into that big time later in the show. The kind of main story on the public equity side is Disney. Disney CEO Bob Iger has secured the support of Activist Value Act, who will back Disney's proposals for the board. At the same time, a very small activist hedge fund, Blackwell's Capital, has some other proposals for board nominees, but is in line with Bob Iger. That support important because Bob Iger is trying to ward off uh, Nelson Peltz and Tree and Capital, another activist who have not been happy with Disney's business performance over the last two years. The stock essentially flat. You can see the kind of volatility in trading throughout Wednesday's session. Let's get down into detail, bring in Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, who leads our screen time coverage. I guess, Lucas, what is the need to know here of this morning's developments and statements? Well, it's further proof that, I I guess let's start with, it's a really unusual situation to have a company of this magnitude with all these different activist investors swirling and agitating. Um, But there's been some questions as to what exactly Nelson Peltz wants and what they're seeking from Disney, because it seems like Disney has been doing a lot of the things that they have advocated for. Um, And then the appearance of Value Act Uh, and and now this third entity gives some ballast to Bob Iger ahead of the shareholder meeting later this year and would seem to put him in pretty good position. Um, And so I I just think it it gives Iger a a vote of confidence. So remind us, Nelson Peltz wants himself on the board and a former executive of Disney. Meanwhile, Value Act and Disney itself want who exactly? Well, yeah, Nelson Peltz wants Jay Rasulo, who was the CFO under Bob Iger a long time ago and once was thought to be a potential successor. Bob Iger ended up sort of anointing Tom Staggs as a successor instead. Tom Staggs didn't end up succeeding Bob Iger because Bob Iger didn't want to go anywhere. Uh, But unlike Jay Rasulo, who clearly has an axe to grind with Iger, Staggs and his counterpart Kevin Mayer uh, who has also been, uh, you know, at one point in time thought he might succeed, have been happy to advise Bob a little bit, uh, Kevin Mayer more so. Um, you know, Bob is basically saying, let me do what I'm doing because we have a plan. We've already added some board members recently uh, who are who are sort of, or are proposing board members uh, who are going to join. Um, and so he thinks that his candidates are, are, are just fine. That includes, uh, I believe, Gorman from Morgan Stanley and then there, uh, someone who used to run Sky. We keep an eye on the comings and goings when it comes to personnel. Lucas Shaw does it so brilliantly for us. We thank him. Meanwhile, let's get to the intricacies of ultimately what this means from a business case for Disney, a valuation case, and, and more broadly how it fits into the consolidation we anticipate within media for 2024. Geetha Raganathan is with us from Bloomberg Intelligence. And Geetha, just already, to the, Lucas made that point that a lot of the work that Bob Iger has been doing seems to be in line with where activist investors are wanted. What, 8,000 jobs eliminated, $7.5 billion of costs re- re- removed. What more could investors want right now? Yeah, I mean, he has done a lot of the things, obviously, that the activist investors have wanted. And you're absolutely right in terms of cost cuts, in terms of right-sizing content expenses. Uh, you know, they've brought down content expenses from about $30 billion to $27 billion to now $25 billion. And I think the biggest takeaway, Caroline, from the latest earnings call was that they're getting their free cash flow back to pre-pandemic levels. So free cash flow for 2024 expected to be $8 billion. Uh, they're also restoring the dividend. So there's obviously a lot that they're doing, uh, but I think there is still some frustration with 
Disney's management because we, we do know that Bob Iger last year had spoken about how the linear TV assets are in secular decline and he had kind of spoken about uh, you know how the future for those are very bleak but we've not really seen any concrete action from him in terms of what he's going to do with those assets and I think that's leading to a little bit of frustration plus of course you have the studio we've had a whole string of misfires you know whether it's the latest Marvel's movie or just not kind of living up to what we expect from Disney and so they obviously have to do a lot of work on that front as well but but we have to remember I mean these things are going to take change takes time it's not going to happen overnight but you're absolutely right Bob Iger is definitely I think the right person to do it there's a lot of confidence but again it is going to take a while Blackwell's saying exactly that in the statement as a statement shareholders deserve the opportunity to continue to really support Disney's turnaround and transformation under Bob Iger meanwhile though Nelson Peltz says one of the issues he has is compensation misalignment, governance and succession, which he says have been issues that play the company for decades. What more could be done on those three, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, succession obviously has been this constant pain point for Bob Iger. But, you know, he's obviously he's brought in the CFO was was, uh, you know, a lingering issue. They obviously have Hugh Johnston now in and they have a whole slew of, of board members that uh, they just actually brought uh, to, to the board. I mean, uh, Lucas just pointed out Jeremy Derrick from Sky, who has a very rich experience in terms of content distribution, content creation. And then, of course, you have James Gorman, who's who's a real heavyweight. So uh, they, they obviously can get a lot of perspective there. Uh, um, so, uh, I, again, uh, I think they have all of the things in place. We have to really see what they do in terms of strategic direction for, for a few of their assets, especially ESPN, and then the, the outstanding ownership issue with Hulu. Agita, uh, this is the Value Act thesis on Disney. They basically state... Disney's the world's leading entertainment company. They talk about the IP. They talk about the parks business. And they say in the statement this morning, as legacy technologies transition to digital platforms, we believe Disney can lead the media industry forward. Does Bloomberg Intelligence share Value Act's thesis around Disney? Absolutely. Um, Disney has the best in-class brands. There is no doubt about that. Yes, we have seen a little bit of underperformance, as I just spoke about on, in terms of you know, the, the studio side, but they absolutely have all of the levers in place. I mean, you, you look at the media assets, they have you know, fantastic properties, whether it's Marvel, whether it's Pixar, you know, whether it's Star Wars, they have all of the franchises that people love. And then, of course, you have the parks business, which has been performing extremely well. I just don't think they're getting enough credit for it so the, the question is what happens next right black blackwells has some different board proposals value act is backing disney's proposals for the board there will be a shareholder meeting if you sort of game planned and modeled the scenario where nelson pelts is appeased i think we said that all year last year didn't we caroline appeasing pelts does he get appeased based on the reporting you've read this morning yeah, it's going to be, I think he's going to fight really hard. Uh, I mean, this this is going to be a really contentious fight, I think, between Pelts and, and Disney. He obviously does definitely want to put himself on the board. He definitely wants to see Jay Rizzullo on the board. I don't think Disney kind of needs that distraction right now. Uh, it really uh, is going to come down to what uh, I think Bob Iger, he's obviously been shoring up his defenses with the Value Act news, with the Black World's news. It's going to come down to, you know, what, if, if he can announce something, uh, if there are any near-term cat- catalyst in terms of strategic initiatives that can kind of really appease Nelson Peltz, whether they can come up with something on the linear TV side, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of plans for those linear TV assets, or if there is some kind of announcement with respect to ESPN. Uh, you know, we know that they've been kind of searching for that strategic partner, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the big digital players or maybe even the leagues themselves. Right. Those talks have really not gone anywhere. So again, if anything comes up on that front, I think it really uh, does kind of reinvigorate the stock price a little bit. Agitha Ranganathan with really detailed analysis from Bloomberg Intelligence of what Lucas Shaw called a highly unusual situation with activist investors. Sticking with activist investors, another story, another story we're tracking. Gambling group Entain named the CEO of activist investor Eminence Capital to its board. A shareholder has been pushing to improve the British company's performance. Eminence, which holds Entain shares, has been critical of the company's deal-making approach and suggested they could explore divesting some or all of its stake in the U.S. betting joint venture BetMGM, which it co-owns with MGM Resorts. 
Let's talk about China US because one key American company, it's kind of been able to navigate the rocky relationship between Washington and Beijing, and it's been Apple. But mounting tensions between the two superpowers, they're making things ever more complicated for the company. And Bloomberg Business Week columnist Max Trafkin has a story out just about this. And ultimately, what is changing? There seems to be two key issues at stake that are going to make Apple's life difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So the two issues, number one is competition. So mm-hmm. Huawei, which, you know, the big Chinese telecom manufacturer for years was hobbled by these export controls instituted under Donald Trump, maintained by Joe Biden. And early last year, you know, they came out with a new phone, the Mate 60 Pro, which has a chip that is pretty close to the state of the art. It's really the first phone in a couple of years that's come close to the iPhone, you know, potentially competitive. And then on the other hand, you have restrictions. So you have the government preventing people in China from bringing phones into the workplaces of state-backed companies. And these two things together are a real problem for Apple because you have the government telling people not to use it and then all of a sudden some real genuine competition presenting itself. Max, this is a chart that shows the sort of breakdown of revenues by geography on a quarterly basis. And I think back to November on the earnings call where China overall was soft. And the narrative from executives was this was simply to do with Mac and iPad because there were no new uh, Macs or iPads. But the caveat that Apple tried to put in there that green bar on the right-hand side being propped up by a record for iPhone sales in greater China. Um, In your piece, which you title in 2024, the year US-China tensions finally trip up Apple, is it the iPhone specifically that is the battleground here, or is it the whole business over in China? I mean, certainly the whole business. And and we should just take a few steps back and say, you know, Apple is completely intertwined with China. You know, it relies on China for its supply chain, and it's also, as that chart you're showing shows, a substantial part of the sort of consumer-facing business. The growth of the Chinese market has been very good to Apple. But when you talk about Apple, you know, the iPhone dominates, and it, and it, it matters a lot here. And again, these are sort of faint signals that we started to see um, last year. When we talk to analysts, they're seeing, first of all, growth in Huawei's sales, and they're expecting at least some pain for Apple in China. But again, it's not clear how much because Chinese consumers still you know, love this company. They still love the iPhone and, and have still been buying it. I mean, as we wrote in the story, there were you know, lines at Apple stores in December, even as these restrictions were being reported by Bloomberg and others. It's an interesting test for Tim Cook in particular, right? Because he was the supply chain guy before he became the CEO. And in many ways, yeah, they're eyeing India, but they haven't stepped away from China. Well, part of the problem that Apple has here is they are a major employer in China. So this is a this is a political issue in China. China does not want them to necessarily diversify their supply chain, while Apple at the same time, you know, would very much like to not be totally dependent on this on a country where, as we saw during COVID, mm-hmm. uh, as well as the demonstrations in front of these iPhone factories uh, in 2022, you know, that comes with risks. So you sort of have a push and pull. And some people have seen these restrictions that the government has been putting on iPhones as sort of a message from China saying, you know, don't, you know, you don't want to move out of this country too much because because that that could create problems for the local market. So so it's kind of a delicate balance. But the one thing that Apple has going for it, again, are these devices that even though even if they have competition, it, they are still genuinely loved by consumers. And when you look at the the chips and so on, you know, still ahead of what the domestic manufacturers are producing. All right. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Max Chafkin, whose latest in Business Week is a must read. Check it out on the year ahead for Apple in China. Sticking with China, in an effort to take a softer tone on the gaming industry, China has reportedly fired the top official of the gaming watchdog agency. Bloomberg's Henry Wren is in London with more. This happened overnight US time, and it's kind of a walk back on what were strong regulations that rocked equity markets at the time. Yes, indeed. So two media reports uh, indicate that. So Feng Shixin, who's head of um, the China's um, publishing unit of the publicity department, would depart from his role. Um, So just to caveat here, because there's no official Chinese government statement saying that Feng Shixin would depart or being fired from his role. However, this does seem that the China's gaming regulator is softening its stance toward the video game sector. Just remember in 
late December, the gaming regulator published a sweeping set of curbs limiting Chinese players' playing time as well as spending on video games. And those were um, badly received by the market. We've been seeing a drop in industry bellwether such as Tencent as well as NetEase as well as other smaller video game stocks in China in late December. Whiplash, I think, is the takeaway for now. Henry Wren, we thank yeah, you so much for the latest on what well, seems to be a changing of sentiment when it comes to gaming, at least for the interim. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're, we're going to talk all things AI and cybersecurity. CrowdStrike CEO is going to be joining us. George Kurt, stick with us for it. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, it's time for Talking Tech. And first up, Samsung is leaning into AI as the key to unlocking greater sales this year. The smartphone maker plans to launch its next flagship device on January 17th. And the teaser to the launch promises that, quote, Galaxy AI is coming. And SpaceX launched its first six satellites capable of offering mobile phone services with T-Mobile. Operating like a cell tower in space, the Starlink satellites work with users' existing phones rather than using specialized equipment to bring connectivity to remote areas. Plus, Atos is in talks to sell its big data and cybersecurity business to Airbus for as much as 1.8 billion euros. That's about 2 billion US dollars. This is the French tech company faces heavy debt repayments at our shares fell following the news. Cara. Yeah, let's stick on the area of cybersecurity and really what it means for 2024. Some of the risks, maybe some of the rewards. CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz joins us now to really spell out what you're seeing on the ground at the moment, George. We were all thinking about artificial intelligence as not only a threat in terms of cyber, but also defense too. How are you seeing generative AI come into your playbook at CrowdStrike? Well, when we think about AI, that certainly was the hot topic of uh, 2023. And as you mentioned, it certainly is and can and will be used uh, for nefarious purposes uh, by the adversaries. But when you think about companies like CrowdStrike, it really is a, a key part of our uh, success going forward. We spent a lot of time on something we call Charlotte AI, which is our generative AI play in terms of help helping customers really protect themselves and leverage the collective knowledge of CrowdStrike, but more than just a chatbot, actually do work on behalf of our customers using our technology. So we think it's a game changer, something that can take eight hours of work and turn it into 10 minutes of work for a security analyst. And we think we're going to get better outcomes for our customers. So we're really excited about it. And it's a big part of our playbook going forward. Mm, and keeping humans in the loop when it comes to Charlotte AI. I'm interested in whether you can pinpoint any real areas where generative AI has made a real impact in terms of cyber threats. What have you actually seen? Well, there is this concept of dark AI, and that is um, you can think about using something uh, like ChatGPT without Rails, right? Uh, fraud GPT, as an example, is, is uh, some technologies that are out there where you can essentially leverage um, AI to create things like phishing emails, to uh, research vulnerabilities, to uh, automate sort of the creation of uh, cyber uh, crime campaigns. So what it really does though, and, you, and if you think about generative AI and what it's done for everyone else, is it takes this collective knowledge and sort of makes it available to the masses. So the, the challenging part that we have now is it makes cyber attacks even more available to maybe folks who don't have all of the knowledge but can actually ask a generative AI technology to do something on its behalf. Mm -hmm. So cyber crime is gonna be even more and more prevalent than it is today. Uh, George, 12 months ago, almost to the day, you and I sat down in Las Vegas at CES. And what transpired over the course of 2023 were large scale attacks. I think you guys call them big game hunting in your tracking of, of these kind of scales of attacks. And, right. and going into 2024, that's continued. What are the reasons behind that? Why are you seeing a resurgence and continuation of the wide scale attack? Well, it's the old adage, you know, you can go where the money is, right? I, there's a lot of money in these cyber attacks because the adversaries have been so successful in being able to ransom uh, and get paid. And when we think about what we saw over the last year, and, and you and I talked about it a year ago, you're, you're spot on at CES, 
it was really the fact that uh, we saw this, this sort of double extortion, which was the adversary could encrypt all the data and basically pay you to unencrypt it. Or if organizations, which they have gotten better and, and they backed up their data and restored it, they would take a copy of it and then they would then leak yes. that. So that was the extortion piece. Right. So we saw a lot of that in 2023. And now uh, I think it's the triple threat. We're seeing now the SEC rules coming in. And in fact, we've seen adversaries not only encrypt, but also go to the SEC uh, as a way to get companies to pay quicker because of the four day rule they have in terms of reporting. So now uh, it really opens up uh, the aperture for the for the adversaries. CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz, uh, it's a great way to kick off 2024, though I would say the conversation around cyber and the threat hasn't stopped at any point. Cara and I, two days into the new year, thank you so much for your time. Caroline did a great job at the top of the show. You're also talking about Bitcoin. Um, volatility in the session, it, it would be foolish to say there is a clear causal link or catalyst uh, because there is a lot of news reports out there all told, Cara, I think what we're doing is taking stock uh, of where we are or are not with Bitcoin ETF applications and the decisions that the regulators will or will not take. Precisely. And headline risk in head of that. Someone to help break us down whether this volatility is to be expected. Fadi Abu Alpha is with us, head of research for Copper. Now, that's a custodian of digital assets. And you in particular focus on markets, on blockchain-based financial market infrastructure. So, Fadi, should we anticipate this sort of volatility into a key date like January 10th when indeed we all feel the SEC has to make some view on a couple of ETFs and therefore maybe all of the ETFs? You know what? It's, it's an interesting question about time. If we were talking about this a year or two ago, we'd be wondering whether an ETF would ever be approved. Now we're talking about when will it be approved. So we're a lot closer to a very important moment in cryptocurrencies history. The when it's going to happen isn't really that important. We know that it will happen. We know that BlackRock has a very uh, great track record in getting their ETF appro applications approved. So there's not really much worry about it getting approved at this point. The when is going to be something that markets are going to look at and it's going to cause a little bit of volatility and for traders that's, that's great they want volatility for the long-term investors who want to actually buy the etf they're going to just uh, hang on a little bit that's all uh Fadi, caroline and i always say on this program uh, Bitcoin is our risk asset of choice. And sometimes it moves in close correlation with equities. Sometimes it doesn't. But you do note that there is some volatility in selling in markets broadly, particularly on higher or stretch valuation tech stocks. How much of this is just going into the new year, new markets, fresh perspective? You know, you, you mentioned Nasdaq. And if we were looking at this again a couple of years ago, we're, we're going to say that Bitcoin's now trading again like a tech stock. And actually, um, if you look at on a weekly basis, the correlation with the S&P 500 is at its highest since May 2023. So the correlations are still there, but Bitcoin isn't going drastically down as we've seen with the Nasdaq over the past couple of days into the new year. So Bitcoin's actually doing quite well, even if it's been seen a little bit of volatility uh, today on the back of some not so vetted news. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think I know what you're, you're referencing. And, and Fadi, I would say this to our audience. This is less than scientific, but I've seen posts on X, other blogs that make the argument that actually Bitcoin currently is not pricing in a roadmap for approval on Bitcoin ETF. Are you able to make that argument that, that, that the price of Bitcoin, even the surge of recent weeks, could not reflect uh, th that, that potential outcome? I think we're still at a state of a little bit of gambling in crypto markets. There's still a lot of leverage in the system. If you look at potential cash and carry trades, if someone wants to take a near risk-free return, you're looking at 15, 20%. But the reality is, is for that you to take advantage of that, you need to buy the spot market, put it in under custody, trade it on, on global markets and take advantage of that yield. Um, the reality is, what happens when these liquidations occur is that people will have to 
go back in, buy more Bitcoin, and do the same process all over again. So it's sort of the self-fulfilling cycle, especially when we go into a positive cycle with Bitcoin. It, it feeds off each, each other, and it, it does the same when we go in a negative cycle. That's all. There's been this sort of flurry of activity, an awful lot of box ticking needed to be done with the SEC. Think of companies talking about their authorized participants that are involved to be able to create, redeem the shares within the ETF. You've got, of course, a bit of a rush for people to have overall the clear language that the SEC is wanting to see as well when it comes to cash only creation. So if we if we don't get all the box ticking necessary, and if the SEC doesn't want to make a kingmaker out of just one or two ETFs, and we do hold out, and we don't see something by January the 10th, will we fade this rally? Do we have to fade this rally? We could we could see Bitcoin drop as well. Yes, it's not it's not inconceivable to see that Bitcoin can can drop to thirty seven thousand. A lot of analysts that look out outside the traditional markets and they look at the blockchain activity are arguing that we could see a correction to thirty seven thousand, maybe lower. If you ask me, if I look at sort of a, a revision to the mean, you could even argue that it could go to twenty seven thousand. But ultimately, when we're talking about the ETF approval, we're talking about long term investors who are mm. going to come because they don't want to manage the security of their digital assets. And so at that point, it's a completely different argument. It's it's inevitably going to go up. So the, the idea that uh, an ETF is going to either make or break Bitcoin in the next six months is a little bit wrong. We need to look at who the ETF is really going to be addressing as a market um, rather than investors and traders who, who who thrive on the volatility that we're seeing today. Yeah, and using future strategies and have been doing that for, well, for a few years when the liquidity is there, Fadi. I'm interested as to therefore, have you quantified what sort of scale of money you think will come in as and when a spot Bitcoin ETF is approved? What sort of inflows you anticipating? Um, I don't really have a number for you. To be honest with you, I think it's it's a narrative that cryptocurrency markets have really sort of latched onto as something positive, as a catalyst after a couple of years of really difficult um, um, things happening within the market. But what is really going to happen is that we're going to see larger investors understand that buying a Bitcoin ETF is going to be a lot more expensive than actually taking custody of their own assets. Mm. And the opportunities on a um, 24-7 day, uh, round the clock, round the year markets are going to be a lot more lucrative than buying something that's traded on a US-based exchange only or any any sort of exchange-traded products that's sort of locked into traditional hours. We're entering a very different financial market infrastructure. And I think Bitcoin is the start of investors understanding that digital assets offer a lot more interesting opportunities. Uh, Fadi, your analysis is referenced in the main Bitcoin story on the Bloomberg terminal, Bloomberg.com this morning. Uh, You're listed as head of research, but Copper is a crypto custodian. So I just I went down the rabbit hole. Uh, Coinbase is also a crypto custodian. Explain the competition in that market and what it is. I think we're addressing very different markets. So Coinbase is a crypto custodian, but I think it also addresses a much more retail focused audience. And it's and it's done great. I think I don't think the crypto industry would actually be where we're at without the initiative that Coinbase has put forward. Digital asset custodians such as Copper are focused more on financial market infrastructure and real world digital assets and removing and mitigating the counterparty risks that we've seen on exchanges, um, perhaps not Coinbase, on other exchanges that are not so reputable that have been hacked. Whereas you use Uh, investors would use copper to mitigate their counterparty risk and still be able to trade on all these exchanges. I think that's the main difference between um, companies such as copper, who's focused primarily on financial market infrastructure and custody and being able to provide the tools, and Coinbase, which has a much more, uh, not retail focused, um, primarily a retail focused outfit, but um, it's just a different kind of um, offering to the clients. All right, Fadi Abu Alpha of Copper, great to have you on the program, Bloomberg Technology. Thank you for your time. Now, coming up here on the show, we're going to talk about the state of the venture capital industry in 2024 with Rebecca Lin from Canvas Ventures. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology.
In December, it was Open View in Boston, and now another VC firm is shutting down. This, a solo GP, Countdown Capital, is an early stage investor focused on aerospace and defense startups. Founder Jay Malik posted on X that despite delivering strong performance, he believes the future of industrial VC favors larger firms than his. Firm is shutting down just 16 months after closing a new $15 million investment fund. Ed. Let's keep it with it. Let's talk about what this means for the future. Uh, some funds were started, some funds closed, drop off in activity. Will we see consolidation in the space? I want to bring in Rebecca Lynn, co-founder, general partner of Canvas Ventures with me here on set in San Francisco. I've been looking at this chart, VC-backed public listing values historically. 2021, a lot was going on across the SPAC space in particular, but also just traditional listings. The market closed in 2022. Caroline and I got a little bit excited towards the end of 2023, and we're trying to work out what happens in 2024. And I bring the chart up because you've been at this 10, 15 years. Series B is your sweet spot. There must be loads of portfolio companies that have matured since investment, and you're wondering, how do I get out? Yes, yes, exactly. I think um, in venture, what I learned really early is you don't time the market. What you do is you build really profitable companies built on fundamentals. And it's one of the problems we've seen over the last 10 years with this focus on hyper growth and unicorn status. It's really not what creates these very profitable, long, enduring public companies. And so I don't think the answer is, you know, how do you get out? It's how do you create a profitable company that has options and opportunities when the windows open? And when you look at the the big hits we've had, including Doximity, Lending Club, and others, they were actually profitable and growing years before they went public. And so as a company, you really want to control your own destiny. And you do that by a core focus on the fundamentals and a path to profitability. If you look at the pitch book data for 2023 <laughs> last year, mm-hmm. looks like we'll hit 150 billion of venture funding to drop off. But one of the kind of artificial bright spots, forgive the, the mm-hmm. wording, was artificial intelligence, right? There was a lot of activity, large rounds, right. even at Series A, debut yeah. rounds. Right. Is that enough to carry momentum over into 2024 or is that now ended? I think that will continue to some extent. So a couple things. So yes, there was a huge drop off last year. It was 50% down from the year before. And we haven't seen that low of a number since 2015, just to sort of, you know, emphasize how much of a drop off we felt last year. And with AI, what you saw was you saw, you know, one in every four dollars was invested in the AI space. I think we'll continue to see that. But I also think there's going to be a real day of reckoning, too, for AI in companies that are wanting to, that need to find profitable business models. And we're seeing that, you know, the big companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, all struggling with how to really make AI profitable and how to, um, how to work those business models, right? And to that point, when you're thinking about the checks to write, I, I think of an exit that you have had, Case Text. I mean, we're seeing more and more <coughs> legal AI companies come to the fore. We're about to interview another one, actually, it's just had a funding round. Is, are they going to be able to operate independently? Have they got enough of the data that is rich and bespoke to them to fight off ultimately OpenAI or Microsoft or Google just being able to replicate it themselves? Yeah, and I think that's a great question in terms of you know, what it really takes for an AI company to succeed. So we've had a front row seat in AI since we invested in Siri you know, back in sort of the first round of this, right? Case Techs was a really unique situation. Case Techs had been operating for about 10 years in the space with 10,000 unique clients and all the data behind that. And so they had, uh, had access to the large language models for you know, probably six or seven years and had been working with it for a decade. And were really one of the very first people in the sandbox for OpenAI because of that. So I would say not all legal startups are the same. And Case Text was very unique because they had this large customer base and the data with that. So I guess the, the answer is maybe. But I would be fairly concerned starting a company right now in a, in a space without having a unique customer base and you know proprietary data and going up against the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons. Rebecca, we came into this conversation with you talking about <laughs> Countdown Capital and yet another, this was a solo GP, but another venture capital firm in and of itself shutting up shop. Is that going to happen as well? Can you speak to your own industry being forced to consolidate or having to wind down, not just the portfolio companies that you've backed? 
Right, absolutely. So it's, it's been really interesting over the past you know, 15 years since I've been in venture. Um, this environment looks very much like the environment in which I entered in, in 2008. I, uh, we launched our fund when Lehman crashed pretty much that very same week. And, uh, and that it's a great time to invest in, in, in companies. Uh, when it comes to venture capital firms, there are three times more venture capital firms today in existence than when I started in, uh, in, in 2008. There are about 1,000 firms at that point in time. And there's approaching 3,000 firms right now. And what we have mm-hmm. seen in every, you know, in every industry cycle is that um, venture is a cyclical industry. It ebbs and flows. It sort of peaks every 10 mm-hmm. or so years. And what we see from that is we do see consolidation in, in every cycle. But what that creates are amazing firms like Benchmark and, and Redpoint, where sort of the best of you know, partners and other firms join together and form new firms. And so we're, we'll see a lot more of that, I believe, in the upcoming year or two. And, and that's an exciting thing for venture overall. We just have 30 seconds left. What's the big sort of thematic area you're focused on for 2024? A uh, big thematic area for 2024, I really think, you know, healthcare remains an untapped opportunity, uh, and, and especially in applications for AI. It's, it's uniquely uh, suited for AI because there's a lot of money going into it. People are, are um, spending a lot of money to solve these problems in healthcare, and, uh, and I think it's a really rich area for an application of AI. Rebecca Lynn, co-founder and general partner of Canvas Ventures. Robin AI, now it's a maker of contract management software, says it's raised $26 million in a Series B funding round led by Singapore's Temasek Holdings. Here to talk more about this, the impact of AI on the legal industry more broadly, is Robin AI CEO Richard Robinson. Richard, great to have you on the show. And look, I mean, what, less than 12 months, I think it's only 10 months since your Series A. Was this opportunistic? Why did you have to go and raise the funds? Yeah, like you said, it was opportunistic. We're seeing a once in a generation shift away from traditional SaaS tools to AI. And so in light of lots of demand and a need to really expand our R&D efforts, we, we took the opportunity to think about raising more capital. Uh, the Singapore angle here is really interesting. So Temasek is leading the round, but you guys also plan to open a, a presence in Singapore. Why? Well, we want to be a global business. We think that the last generation of fundamental technology like the internet gave rise to massive global businesses like Google and Facebook. And we think that AI is going to usher in another generation of companies of that size and scale. And so we want to be global. We've always been significantly ambitious. We've got customers in Asia, and so we wanted to expand that presence, and Tomasek made perfect sense as a partner. You talk about this shift of SaaS to AI, and basically you're a co-pilot concept that you bring AI sort of to standard office software, and in fact, this particular co-pilot that you're announcing and been using is is free on Microsoft Word add-ons, if I'm correct. So with the customers you already have, PepsiCo, PwC, you've you've got a lot of key names. What, where's your revenue generation coming from? Why do these VC names want in on the round? Yeah, I think primarily our revenue comes from big companies. We sell to in-house legal teams because we want to help companies go faster. So our company, the customers are the Fortune 500, the world's biggest private equity funds. They're people who do transactions. And I think what's got investors excited is, number one, they see that AI is changing the whole industry. You had that in your, your last segment. You know, the legal industry is going to change and it's going to be transformed by AI. But number two, they're seeing a startup that has real traction with really discerning customers. And that, yeah. that means that we could build something quite defensible here. Uh, we've been showing video of how Robin AI works as a sort of contract drafting assistant tool. And Karen makes a really important point. It's an add-in into Microsoft Word. But Microsoft is doing a lot with its own co-pilot, right, uh, is in terms of productivity tool. Are you worried about the, the kind of design of the system here that Microsoft is offering something similar? Not really. Microsoft's product is, you're right, similar, but it's really a general tool. It's designed to do everything, a little bit like Microsoft Word is. It's a generic tool. And the legal industry is going to be worth a trillion dollars next year. It is one of the biggest industries on the planet. And I think it needs its own bespoke 
AI system mm. that understands legal documents, understands lawyers' workflows, understands the law. And so you, the Microsoft Copilot's not going to do that. It's catering to a much wider audience. We're really this, the best in the world at legal AI. And I think that's going to be its own race that requires its own focus. Robin AI CEO Richard Robinson. As a law school graduate, the idea of automating drafts in the legal context, I know a few people in my world that would be very interested in that. We're grateful for, you, for your time. Thanks. No. What a great conversation, Ed. Meanwhile, look, I mean, we're back to it. Conversations in 2024 focused on AI, focused on cyber, focused, of course, on, well, maybe some of the valuations we're seeing as well. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Yeah, there's an element of deja vu, but recap on the podcast wherever you get yours, Apple, Spotify, iHeart and Bloomberg. From SF in New York, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.